time. Um, uh, I would like to introduce the speaker uh, for uh, this evening's outstanding alumni lecture. Uh, Mary Lehman McDonald is a 1982 graduate of our, of our program, formerly the Department of Labor Studies. Uh, and Mary has gone on to have a, a distinguished career in the labor movement. Uh, after earning a master's degree at uh, Cornell University, uh, the second leading school of industrial and labor relations in the country. Uh, uh, she went on to work uh, as a labor educator for Cornell University. Uh, she was uh, formerly the assistant director of education and community services for the national AFL-CIO. Uh, she has been the director of the American Federation of Teachers Healthcare Division, a part of the teachers union that represents 100,000 nurses across the country. Uh, she's been the director of, of, uh, of that uh, group for 20 years. Uh, she's worked, uh, she uh, represents AFT um, uh, as the chair of the, American, the Maryland Healthcare Foundation and also on the National Quality Forum, which are groups that work to uh, make our healthcare system in this country um, uh, work uh, more effectively. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with Mary in her role um, as a uh, union leader, uh, and I'm very, very pleased to be able to welcome her back to Penn State uh, to give us uh, the uh, 15th Annual Outstanding Alumni Lecture. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I know that y'all are anxious to get out of here and get to your Halloween parties, uh, so I'm going to try not to hold you too long. But I do want to start by saying that I am, um, I am deeply appreciative of this honor. I certainly did not expect when I left Penn State to come back as an outstanding alumni. Life is going to take you in strange directions and unexpected places, and one of you will probably end up back here someday giving the same kind of a speech. Uh, like everyone who graduates from Penn State, I hold, I hold it in my heart. I went to other schools. Penn State is still extremely special to me. I'm always very loyal to it. I hold it in my heart. Um, especially what was then the Labor Studies Department, which was a much smaller department. Those of you who are alumni here will remember Mitzi and Arlene, who were like our surrogate mothers. Uh, we had uh, great, great teachers, great faculty, Frida Rosen. Uh, Dick Hindle, who is here, was a spectacular teacher and also a great friend and a mentor to me, and I want to thank him. And uh, especially Ron Filippelli, who I've known since I was 14 years old, uh, which, as you can tell, was a while ago. Uh, Ron was a spectacular, probably the best teacher that I ever had. I am here because of Ron's labor history and theories of labor relations class. I am here because of those classes I took. I started one way, like many people in Penn, who come to Penn State, you come in as one thing, thinking that you're going to be one thing, and then you take a couple classes and you end up someplace entirely different. A lot of transformations happen here. My transformation happened because of the labor history course I came, I took. I took Ron's labor history course and the world kind of fell into place for me. Because when I was here, I was, when I was a freshman here, big difference between me and the other freshmen who were here, they were 18, I was 28, okay? I had, worked, I had worked for 10 years in the workplace, mostly as a secretary before I went to school. So when I took labor studies classes or things that had to do with labor and employment relations, I brought to it 10 years of knowledge of having worked, not only worked in a workplace, but worked on sort of the wrong end of the power relationship in a workplace. Um, you know, you, your secretaries generally do not um, rise to management. The one in my organization has risen to management, but usually there is kind of a class divide in the workplace, and I was on the wrong end of the class divide. And so when I took, the, the, when I took my seat in the labor history course, I was looking at the material through a completely different lens than the people who were around me. Because I, this was not a summer job for me. This was not an internship. This is who I was. And after I took this class, I turned into somebody else. I became somebody else. But because I brought this experience of having worked in the workplace, I knew some things that the people around me did not know. For instance, I knew that organizations don't generally function the way they tell you that they function. You know, I knew that actually the best and the brightest don't always rise to the top. You know, management doesn't always know exactly what's going on. Um, and I knew that power, the getting of power, 
the maintaining of power, the use of power is the thing that nobody really talks about much in the workplace, but it is an all-consuming you know, endeavor. Uh, it's the unacknowledged current that runs through everything in the workplace. I knew a little of that because when I worked as a secretary, I had a couple of examples uh, happen to me, and I worked as a secretary here on campus. Um, when, when I was a secretary, you got two 15-minute breaks, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And there was what was called a break room. So you went into the break room, and it was this dingy little room. I think people still smoked then. I think you're allowed to smoke. So it would be like ashtrays and piles of Women's Day magazines with all the good recipes already torn out. And you'd, you'd go into this break room, and that was your 15-minute break. So, so my friend Jeanette and I, it was spring, and we thought, well, why don't we just kind of go up and go through the door and sit on the patio outside, you know? So we did that a couple of times. We sat on the patio and it was nice. It was a lot nicer than the break room. So one day, you know, it was really warm. And so we decided we were gonna go walk down to College Avenue and get an ice cream cone. So we got an ice cream cone, we came back. Two days later, right? A memo comes down from the fourth floor, whatever the management floor was. People are not allowed to leave campus during their break. People are, somebody must have seen us. And suddenly there was this memo. It's like, oh, no, 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 you can't, you can't, you can't leave campus. It's like, what? Oh, maybe it was some insurance thing or something. Or maybe they had emergency typing that they needed to have done. But it was, it was really, it was difficult to kind of figure out who we had offended doing that. And then it wasn't long after that that we were, uh, fall, we went into fall and, um, the, the office manager said, it's time to put up the Christmas decorations. Let's put up the Christmas decorations today. So we did, and took about a half an hour, and we strung all the stuff around, we strung the lights and all that kind of stuff, and uh, we're all happy, 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 everyone's happy, right? Um, about a day, maybe two days later, we got a memo again from the fourth floor, whatever the floor was, saying, you have to take the Christmas decorations down, okay? Because we did not give you permission to put the Christmas decorations up yet, okay? So we had, to all, we had to take all the Christmas decorations, it's gloomy, right? We had to take all the Christmas decorations down again. Then two days later, right, you get a memo that says, okay, now you can put the Christmas decorations up, okay? Just these little pointless things. In the labor movement, we say the boss is the best organizer. It's really true. People, the things that, the, the arbitrary use of power often in, in uh, uh, workplaces, is a much more effective organizer of a union than needing more wages or wanting more wages. So when I took labor history and labor, th labor theories class, it was incredible for me because my experience, all of a sudden there was a framework that I could fit my experience into that perfectly matched my experience. And of course, when I took labor history, I don't know if they still offer labor history courses here, but when I took labor history courses, like everyone else who takes a labor history course, I was shocked by what I heard, because it did not comport with the narrative that I had of American history, where everything was sort of happy and, and you know, not happy, but I, I, I did not know that people died for unions. You know, I did not know the amount of violence, you know, and that people actually died in order to get a union. All I knew about unions was my uncle Dick was a steel worker and the only Democrat in the family, and he was in a union. That was all I knew. It was shocking to me that people, um, people died, and it was very moving to me, and it shaped, it very much shaped the narrative of how I see the world. I'm gonna be speaking to you tonight from that narrative, which is unabashedly and unmistakably pro-union. You know, I've spent 30 years in the labor movement. That doesn't mean I'm 100% uncritical of unions. It doesn't mean I don't understand why managers would get irritated with unions, but I'm a believer, so I'm gonna come I'm going to come from that narrative. It may not be a narrative that you've heard before. I'm not sure. But, and, of course, I'm familiar with the counter-narrative that unions are terrible things. Even in order to get, rid of, uh, in order to get ready for this um, lecture tonight, I read some pieces produced by the Heritage Foundation and some conservative kind of journals. And, of course, I became apoplectic because it was different than my narrative of the world. But uh, uh, you know, it, also, it said that um, they said in the pieces that, that people only organize for more money which is definitely not my experience. It may be what economists think, but it's definitely my experience, and they, not my experience. And they talked about union bosses, you know, and union thugs, which I guess would be me, right? I would be the union boss and the union thug, and Amy and Catherine, who work for me as the assistant directors, would be the, 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 the boss and the thug. We all have stereotypes. My point is we all have stereotypes. We all spend way too much time engaging with people, uh, too little time engaging with people who are different from us 
and way too much time uh, engaging with people who are echo chambers for us. So I'm going to be talking to you tonight, for, uh, tonight from a perspective that you might be a little unfamiliar with. A friend of mine from California said, young people today don't dislike unions. They think of unions kind of like the Amish, as sort of like this strange cult, you know, this weird <laughs> sect that they don't really quite understand. So I'm coming from that perspective. It's good that I took labor history, because if I didn't take labor history, I might be kind of depressed. Uh, American trade unionism is slowly being limited and influenced by changes which destroy the basis on which it is erected. I see no reason to believe that American trade unionism will become in the next decade a more potent social force. This was uh, by the president of the American Economic Association in 1933, which was right before the biggest surge in union organizing in American history. So makes me feel a little better. <laughs> um, why do we need unions? What do unions do? This is a, an ancient question. Richard Freeman and James Medoff asked it over 20 years ago. Unions do many things. I'm going to go through why we need unions today. One is they raise wages for both union and non-union workers. They temper income inequality, and they help to create a middle class in this country. This is, and I'm sure you've all seen this kind of stuff. This was in 2012. The top 10% of earners took, more, took home more than half of the country's total income in 2012, which was the highest level recorded since the government began collecting the relevant data a century ago. The top 1%, which is this, the bottom line, you see it was like uh, 1920, 1929, um, and then 2012. The top 1% took home more than one-fifth of all, the, all of the... Uh, income earned by Americans. The, the last time it was this high was right before the Great Depression, 1929, income inequality. Between 2002 and 2012, wages were stagnant or declined for the entire bottom 70% of the wage distribution. The figures underscore that even after the recession, the good stuff has gone to the folks on top. Uh, and and the, the folks in the middle and the folks below have either not moved or have slipped. Incomes are as co income is as concentrated as it was in the years that preceded the depression of the 1930s, if not more so. And by the way, there are people, and I'm not being, but there are people who are making a lot of money right now. The same, uh, the same uh, article in the New York Times said the median income for CEOs was $15.1 million last year, a 16% raise over the year before. Um, and they say, you know, well, we have to pay people a lot of money because otherwise other companies will steal them away. Um, but actually, the biggest package went to a guy who was retiring from ConocoPhillips who made $156 million as part of his retirement package. And, you know, he wasn't going somewhere, now, somewhere else. We weren't trying to, like, stop him from going somewhere else. When I went to Cornell, uh, when you go up, uh, I was a grad student at Cornell, you go into the coffee room, right, and you're, like, the new grad students are all talking to each other. And I was talking to uh, this grad student, and he, I, he, I asked him, what are you working on? And he said, I'm working on CEO compensation. I'm trying to find out why CEOs are paid as much as they are. And I said, it's, I said they're paid as much as they are because they get to decide, right? And he said, do you mean because they have the burden of res the responsibility of decision making? And I said, no, because they get to decide how much they earn, right? As it turns out, I was closer than he was, <laughs> because there's actually no relationship, or there seems to be very little relationship between the outcomes, how well the company does, and how well the CEO is paid. So um, the declining un unionization, the red line is the union membership rate from 1967 to 2009, declined, and the blue line is the middle class share of aggregate income. Declining unionization was associated with about a third of the increase in wage inequality for men from 1973 to 2007, and about a fifth of the increase for women. Now, why does that matter? Why do we even care about wage inequality? What does it matter if there's really rich people and really poor people and not much in the middle? What does that matter? Some say it doesn't matter. Some say it's fine. It's fine for our economy. Some say it does. It does matter. One of the ones that suggests that it does matter is the CIA, which lists income inequality in its fact book for uh, how it evaluates countries. We are 
The CIA fact book lists us as number 42 out of 140 countries on income inequality, and we are moving up. We actually, they had originally listed us as number 33, but somehow John Stewart got a hold of it and did a program on it, and they came back and said, oh, we recalculated, and we're actually 42 now. It's not as bad as you thought, so. We, but we are moving up in income inequality. We are not anywhere close to the top 10 in income inequality, places like Haiti, Colombia, the townships of Soweto, the slums of Sao Paulo. But having visited all those places that I just mentioned, let me just tell you that is not a direction that we want our country and that we want our society and community to be moving into. Why does income inequality matter? Because the risk that income inequality may amplify the potential for financial crisis, it also could bring political instability makes it harder for governments to make difficult but necessary choices, such as raising taxes or cutting public spending to avoid a debt crisis, and it may reflect poor people's lack of access to financial services. They can't get uh, education, they can't start small businesses, that kind of entrepreneurial activity. There's a point where if people have no hope in the possibility of ever getting any kind of a middle class life, they got nothing to lose. Really, anything goes. I mean, I live in a large urban area in the Northeast. Anything, you know, there's a point where if you, don't, you, don't, you stop having a stake in society if you don't see the possibility of a future. And that's what we're talking about with political instability. This is a quote from George, er, I'm sorry, this was uh, another one. Um, More inequality uh, spells less sustained growth. On, across the bottom is the amount of inequality and then the blue line is how long the, uh, the growth periods were in those countries. So the, the higher the inequality, the lower the period of economic growth in those countries. And then this is a great quote, I think, from George Packer. Inequality is like an odorless gas that saps the strength of democracy. It hardens society into a class system, divides us one from another in schools, in neighborhoods, at work, on airplanes, in hospitals, in what we eat, in the condition of our bodies, in what we think, in our children's futures, in how we die. Inequality makes it harder to imagine the lives of others. There's a point where if we don't care about the overall good of society, we really only care about ourselves, then we're just people who happen to live in the same zip code. You know, we, we stop being a community. So income inequality can have extremely negative impacts on our, the future of our country. What else, do, uh, what else do unions do? Unions improve productivity by not allowing uh, competition on wages. That's supposedly what Friedman and Medoff said. Some people agree, some people disagree. There was a meta-analysis of 73 union productivity studies that showed a near zero effect. They don't really, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. It's hard to say that they improve productivity. According to Freeman and Medoff, they cut Quit, quit rates, turnover rates, by giving people the opportunity to fix things in their workplace. Otherwise, I, my choices are fix it or leave. If I have a union, there's a possibility of fixing it. The other way is to leave, and so presumably they cut turnover rates. They actually can help the, co the companies run better, more efficiently, smoother. We rarely get that opportunity, um, but, but in fact, the person who does the work is the person who knows best how to do the work. There's a, a great um, uh, chief nursing officer for the Voluntary Hospital Association of America who said, you know, the CEO's job is not, to, is not to try and improve how the work processes are done. They don't really know how to do that. Their job is to create the culture that, uh, and the values of the organization. The people who do the work know how, to do, know how the work should be done. And in hospitals, they have something called workarounds that everybody knows that the processes in hospitals are designed terribly, okay? So physicians, everybody, they have formal workarounds that the, that the people who do the work themselves came up with because they know that the way they're supposed to do it makes no sense. So if you can, if you do have the kind of situation where labor and management can work together, labor can help uh, improve efficiency and productivity and help the work get done better. Now, I don't know why this doesn't happen in the United States very much. We had, there was a local in AFSCME, uh, an AFSCME local in Massachusetts. It was a hospital. Uh, one unit had extremely bad patient satisfaction scores. That's a big thing for hospitals. You get paid on patient satisfaction. So one union had a, or one unit 
had a really bad patient satisfaction scores. The union went in, they went from person to person, they interviewed people, they said, what's working well, what's not working well? They, they fixed some things in their workplace, and within about six months, the patient satisfaction scores were the highest in the hospital. So the union went to the hospital CEO and said, you know, look what we did. You know, this is terrific. Can we, let's go out to the other units. The hospital said, nah, nah, that's okay. We're, we're no, nice, thank you, but we're not, we're not interested, you know. Now, you explain to me, because I don't understand, you know, why, um, why that would be the reaction, but that is frequently the reaction. We funded a number of projects to try and get the unions involved in improving work processes, and when and management just, uh, in, many, in too many cases, not all cases, certainly, but in a lot of cases, just does not want to hear it. The last thing that I would say unions do are that they serve a political function. Unions advocate for democratic, big D and small d, progressive principles in politics. Our union, my union, the AFT, has positions on immigrants' rights, gay rights, Iraq, all kinds of stuff. If you want to, uh, you know, people who say that unions are like top-down, you know, organizations that boss everybody around should come to our convention because these, these uh, policy positions get debated passionately from the floor of our convention. This is, um, we sometimes have sort of low-level movie stars come to our convention to give speeches, plenaries, and Bill Gates came one time to our convention. All of our, uh, all of our folks say the same thing at the end when they're asked to evaluate. They say, we don't want those people. We want more time to debate the resolutions. You know, they really, they, um, these are democratic organizations. So uh, people who stereotype is that kind of top-down control, that's not true. We have in the early days of the Republic and starting and then stronger with the CIO been strong advocates for things that had nothing to do with better paychecks. This is a great quote of Walter Ruther's. By the way, um, you know Martin Luther King, uh, the letter from the Birmingham jail? Martin Luther King was thrown into the Birmingham jail for um, leading an illegal boycott. You know who bailed him out of the Birmingham, Birmingham jail? Walter Ruther, the president of the UAW, bailed him out. Walter Ruther said this, the labor movement is about changing society. What good is a dollar more in wages if your neighborhood is burning down? What good is another week's vacation if the lake you used to go to where you've got a cottage is polluted and you can't swim in it and the kids can't play at it? What good is another $100 in pension if the world is going up in atomic smoke? The labor movement in addition to what we do in the United States is the institutional voice that's fighting against repression in countries around the world. In Colombia, where I have been, my teacher union colleagues are targeted for torture and murder because they are leaders in their community. I have carried money into Zimbabwe to help teacher unions in Zimbabwe who are fighting against Robert Mugabe. We are throughout the world in places where there is intense repression. The labor movement is the institutional voice of fighting against that repression. And you're, you would be hard pressed to find a good a democracy where there isn't a labor movement. So if we do all these wonderful things, all right? Free, oh, this is, yeah. Free trade unions are a cornerstone of any effective system of industrial relations that seeks to balance the need for enterprises to remain competitive with the aspirations of workers. This is from the World Bank. Okay, this is not the, from the socialist worker or something. This is from the World Bank. So what do unions do? We raise wages, we reduce turnover, we increase productivity, we help the company uh, to improve work processes, we advocate for democratic um, progressive principles. So if all of that is true, why are we in such bad shape? Why are we down to 11%? We do all these great things. Why are we down to 11% of the workforce when we were at something like 35% in the 50s? Well, there are a lot of reasons. We know that manufacturing jobs have left the country. We know that technology is replacing a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of jobs. But every country, every industrialized country has gone through that. Why has, why has our labor movement been so negatively affected? Some people say we don't need unions anymore, right? Unions were for the 30s. You know, unions were for mine workers. We don't really need unions anymore. People don't need them. I find that difficult to believe because, and here's the reason why, millions of dollars are spent every year on anti-union consultants, okay? And I don't think that management pays for something it doesn't need, okay? So if you go into a, if you go in to try and organize a union, there are, there is an industry 
of folks who will come in and tell you how to get rid of that union. And as I said, I just can't believe people spend money that way if they don't want, to, if they don't need to. You can file for an election to have a union election if you have 30% of the bargaining unit having signed cards saying that you can file. I do not know a single union that would file with less than 65% on cards. Nobody would file with less than 65% because we know that the organizing campaign is going to be so brutal and so difficult that we're going to lose a lot of support along the way. It's illegal to fire somebody for forming a union, but people do because the penalty, the cost-benefit analysis is such that you'd be crazy not to, you know, almost. Um, and people, people say to us, can, can, can we be fired? And we have to say yes. I mean, the law says you can't be fired, but in fact, it can take so long to adjudicate it, and it will kill the union organizing drive that you, will, you are risking your job to form a union. If you, if you don't want to be that blatant and really just fire people, just delay for, forever. We have a hospital in Salem, New Jersey that voted, the nurses in that hospital voted for a union three years ago. The management said, we are never going to bargain, period. Okay? So they are taking advantage of every possibility to, to uh, appeal to the National Labor Relations Board. It's been over three years so far. And the nurses have lost hope there. That's what happens. We had more than 2,500 RNs that we organized in Colorado. It took 17 years to adjudicate the NLRB cases. And by that time, you know, all the nurses who were our supporters had gone, had quit, had lost hope. Hope is the thing, hope is the thing that drives change. That moment when hope is a very dangerous moment. You know, when people have hope, they begin to do things, they, 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 they do things that they wouldn't see themselves necessarily ever doing. When time passes and that hope, then, then you go back into sort of impotence and, you know, you, you just, you can't affect anything. There's a period there, though, when people are in motion and if you can just delay, as some people do, then, um, you know, you can beat a union. So the law is an impediment, let's change it. But speaking as someone who staffed the AFL-CIO's work on the, uh, the last time we tried to do labor law reform, that's not going to happen. Okay? <laughs> we just, that was, we had a Democratic president, we had a Democratic Congress. We couldn't get it then. It's not going to happen. But some folks are now just choosing to completely ignore the law. 80% of organized, because the law is not working, 80% of um, organizing happens outside the NLRB process at this point. There's some very sophisticated tactics being used. SEI used justice for janitor, used zoning ordinance challenges to, uh, to make commercial real estate owners accountable. Unions like ours are using pension funds and investments to put pressure in organizing and bargaining campaigns. The teaching assistants in Madison, Wisconsin. I was out in Madison, Wisconsin uh, when all that stuff was going on in Wisconsin. The teaching assistants don't, do not have the legal right to bargain anymore. Their bargaining was taken away. Excuse me. They got a 4% raise last year. They don't have a legal right to a union. They don't actually have a union. They got a 4% raise last year because they went to Old Main and they did their office hours in Old Main, basically. They demonstrated, they put pressure on the university, and they ended up without a union getting what they, getting what they needed to do. Some, some groups are benefiting from the fact that they actually aren't technically unions. There's a group called the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, farm workers in Florida. Because they are not unions, they can do secondary boycotts, and they can do, uh, sec they, it's not just like I'm saying boycott my employer, I'm saying boycott the people who buy from my employer. So these are folks that pick toma tomatoes, that are involved in tomato growing, okay? Instead of going against their employer, they went against Taco Bell, this coalition. Because they're not a union, they could do that. So they had boycotts of Taco Bell. And they ended up getting um, Taco Bell to agree to an enforceable code of conduct and to um, uh, raises for those folks, even though they weren't the employers. They've had against Whole Foods, against Chipotle. They just had Chipotle just agreed to just sign it. Thank God, because I love Chipotle. Um, uh, Chipotle just signed an agreement with them. So. They're not a union, but they're, but they're working, they're acting like a union. Richard Freeman, in a, a, a book called The Spurts in Union Growth, I love that word for a research paper, spurts in union growth, defining moments in social processes, 
says there's three things that accompanied um, the big rise in union organizing, a change in law, uh, unrest, social unrest, and organizational change from the organizations themselves. The CIO was formed, this new kind of union was formed. He said of these, the least important was labor law change. That if you have the other things, that there is this unrest uh, among workers and a willingness to change institutional forms and say, you know, this is the way unions have always been, but maybe it's not the way unions have to be, then there's um, a possibility of there's a possibility of changing. There's a possibility of forward progress. We have this dramatic mismatch between 1930s forms of uh, representation and 21st century forms of employment. Janice Fine is from Rutgers. She, uh, uh, 20 years ago, there were five non-union organizations that were organizing and mobilizing workers. Uh, in 2012, there were 214. So there is a big uh, growth in things that aren't exactly unions, but do the same thing that unions used to do. Some folks call it alt labor, alternative labor. Uh, the Taxi Workers Alliance, they used to be employees. They were made independent contractors, which means that they could not organize, but they strike, they went on strike anyway, which led to higher pay, health and welfare fund. Restaurant Opportunities Center organizes dishwashers, wait staff, those kinds of folks. They've won settlements totaling about 6.5 million in back wages and penalties. National Domestic Workers Alliance, they were not allowed to organize, but they pressured New York after six years to establish the, uh, the uh, Domestic Workers Bill of Rights with overtime pay, sexual harassment protection. And of course, there are the fast food workers, the minimum wage workers, the minimum wage uh, activity that's going on now. As Chris Rock said, I used to work at McDonald's making minimum wage. You know what that means when someone pays you minimum wage? It's like, hey, I, if I could pay you less, I will, but it's against the law. <laughs> the uh, minimum wage, um, uh, the fast food minimum wage workers, you know, who knows where this is going to go. But what's interesting about it is the community support and the community engagement. As what I'm told is that nobody has been fired yet. There have been strikes across the country at McDonald's. What I've been told is that nobody has been fired yet. And a friend of mine who uh, participated in the community support activities in Milwaukee said, you know, when you got on the bus, it was like the, just the people were just full of energy. These, these kids who were, you know, minimum wage workers, they had nothing to lose. They were trying to, you know, they had some hope of really trying to achieve something. And then you would surround this McDonald's and there would be somebody who decides then that they're going to walk out. You know, they, some people decided before that they weren't, weren't going to show up. They decided then that they would walk out. And they would, the community people would be like cheering like they were heroes. You know, it was great, this tremendous community support. The interesting thing is when they come back the next day for their next shift, the same community uh, groups come together and escort them back in to that. So it's not just like... Oh, we, you know, we're, you know, it's not just like a one-time thing. They help the workers go back in again to make sure that nobody gets fired. There are problems with these new groups. There's, uh, they're small scale. Uh, they get their funding mostly from foundations. They don't have contracts, so you have to keep pressuring. You know, you have to keep demonstrating in order to get anything. There's a group called Arise Chicago, which is increasingly partnering with unions to win formal unionization where it's possible. And like worker centers in New York and LA, Arise Chicago is collaborating to organize car wash folks because you can, you can outsource the making of cars, but you cannot outsource the washing of cars. The washing of cars has to happen where the cars are. So we are organizing, um, we're organizing those folks. Worker centers are movements in, sur in, sur in uh, search of institutions, and our unions are often institutions in search of movements. And then there is the Freelance Workers Union. The Freelance Workers Union is a different kettle of fish altogether. It's got 100,000 members. It's doubled in size in the last two years. They started by providing group health insurance. These are all folks who work, right, freelancers, whatever, right, you know, writers, the tech uh, web folks. Uh, they provide group health insurance benefits to their members. They have a freelancer, they have a freelancer's medical clinic, which is in Brooklyn. Uh, they have healthcare co-ops in Oregon, New York, and New Jersey, which are going to be on the exchanges. They have a 401k plan. They've, they do lobbying work. 
The woman who started it down at the bottom there, um, How to Build a 21st Century Union, Sarah Horowitz, is, um, was a student of mine when I went to Cornell. Uh, she, um, um, I was a grad student, and so I taught sections, uh, the Saturday morning classes, the discussion classes, and Sarah was in one of them. She, uh, she has a seat on the board of the Federal Reserve in New York, and she won a MacArthur Genius Award. Um, I asked her after that what she was going to do with the money from the MacArthur Genius Award, and she said probably she and her husband would get a car with air conditioning for the first time because they did not have one. But Sarah is, uh, Sarah is a lawyer. She's really smart. She comes from her grandparents were, uh, were part of Act II, the Clothing and Textile Workers Union. And what she describes this federation as is the new mutualism. And I'm going to read you from their website. Mutual support is nothing new. The first wave of mutualism saw the spread of worker and farmer cooperatives, credit associations, and similar groups. The government-sponsored uh, programs of the New Deal supplanted the need for many of these groups. But as government and businesses-sponsored supports are dwindling, interest in mutualism is growing and advances in technology make it easier for communities to stay connected. In some ways, Sarah is the Samuel Gompers of the 21st century. She is about self-help. She is about the AFL model of unionism, basically, which is let's all come together, take care, you know, we'll all sort of chip in. We'll, if you want a pension, join the freelancers union. If you want health insurance, join the freelancers union. Her model is Sidney Hillman, who, bought, who built housing for their members in New York, built apartment houses for their members in New York. So everything old is new again. You know, she is basically, Sarah is, uh, Sarah is doing what Sidney Hillman and many before her did. They also have the coolest posters in the world. These are their subway posters, providing health care to freelancers since before it was cool. This is why I took a picture on the subway in New York. Ask not what you can do for capitalism, but what capitalism can do for you. And in the battle of idealists versus entropy, we're still betting on the idealist, which was my favorite. Anyway, all of this is by, saying there's, is by way of saying there is lots of ferment going on now. There is lots of hope. And I'm going to end by saying that I'm at an age where I'm familiar with institutional decay, with things that are going out of business. Okay? I go to a mainline Protestant church. My husband and I get two newspapers, actual physical newspapers, delivered every day. We go to the Baltimore Symphony. We have a subscription to the Baltimore Symphony, and I work for the labor movement. My little Lutheran church in Highland Town you know, has like 25 people in it. It used to have 150 people. Um, the, the Baltimore Sun has a, big, has a big banner on their building celebrating 175 years of being a newspaper because I think they know they're not going to make it to 200 years of being a newspaper. Um, the symphony, you know, it's more and more people on walkers, more and more empty chairs. This is all, you know, these institutions are declining. It doesn't mean the desire to worship is gone. It doesn't mean the desire to hear music is gone or to learn what the news is is gone. It just means these institutional forms are disappearing and other institutional forms are coming and taking their place. Something is stirring. At AFT, we have a new generation of smart, young activists. Our, the median age of staff in our organization in the last five years has gone from 55 to 35. We have some incredibly I don't know what this generation, maybe they, they, you know, I don't know what, what it is with this generation, but we have a lot of really smart young folks who are coming to work for our unions and are interested in what we're doing. So it's their turn, and I'm ready to turn it over to them, but it's very exciting to see them, uh, to see them, uh, to see them coming and to see this stirring and to see this energy, which you now feel not in every union, but you certainly feel it in ours, and I certainly feel positive about it. So just one last thing, and this is just why unions are going to last forever. Two weeks ago, I was on a conference call with this National Quality Forum, and I represent patients on this conference call, and there's another guy who represents purchasers, and then there's all the doctors who are on the call. And it's a real imbalance of power, because we don't understand their language particularly, and we're not, you know, we just, they, they always run right over us, you know, because <laughs> we don't really know how to combat them. So this time we organized. Okay, we, the, the, we got together and we had a couple of conference calls first. We decided we were going to support each other when we were on the conference call. If David said something, I was going to support what David said, you know, and it, it kind of worked out that way. And it ended up that we won this time. We actually beat the doctors this time. And in my mind, you know, I was saying, you know, we're not, 
solidarity forever, man. Solidarity worked then, it works now, and it's going to continue to work in the future, and that's why unions are never going to die. So thank you, thanks very much for this. I really appreciate the honor. And let me turn it back over there. Thank you.